our act of worship through singing. Let's ask a question. Let's build up a little bit of community. And uh, I don't know about you, but I don't like to wait. I mean, how many of you guys prefer waiting for things? Nobody. That's why we have microwaves, which unfortunately also tends to make things not as good as if we were to wait. But uh, hey, your question for this morning, you can go ahead and put it up, is what is one thing that you would be willing to wait in line for hours to do or to buy? Now, before you ask that, I got to share this little, little story. So let's see, I'm trying to think. Sophomore year in college, I went here to, uh, for my first time into Billings. And I met a couple cool cats, and one of those guys happens to be Alex Shin. And, uh, and, and for those who know Neil of Rasky, I met Neil. Well, I went to college with Neil, but Neil was here as well. And it was uh, Black Friday, and we're out by Old Navy. And for whatever reason, they and then another friend wanted to take out some swords and start doing sword fighting as they were waiting. And I'm like, am I about to die? But uh, fortunately, I'm still here. But hey, we're taking the next minute or so and ask that question that's up on the screen to each other. Let's do this. Good morning, everyone. Um, how would you guys stand and join us for a time of worship?
Daniel chapter 3, we read the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they are challenged by the king to bow down to the image. Bow down and worship. Else you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. You probably know the story, and if you don't, you can read it. Daniel chapter 3. And in the story, we read these words that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say. that They, they just tell this king, they say, even if, even if, no matter what, if we bow down, we're not going to bow down, but even if God doesn't save us, we know he is able. And then we read it as the story goes on, they're thrown into the fiery furnace. The furnace is so hot, it kills the people who throw the men in. And the king looks and he sees a fourth person in the fire. A fourth person. A fourth person. Didn't we just throw th three men in? Yes. Well, who's the fourth person? I don't know, but it looks like the son of a god. It looks like brilliance. And not a hair on their head was singed. No smoke on their clothes. It's an amazing story. But friends, it's more than a story. There's another in the fire today. No matter what you're going through, no matter what, what is presenting itself against you, no matter what force is attacking you, no matter what happens in your life, there is a fourth person in the fire. And he is for you. He is not against you. He walks with you. He encourages you. He empowers you. He strengthens you. We are going through a challenging time, to say the least, around our world and America specifically. There's so much brokenness. There's so much pain. There's so much, there's so much uh, just heartache. And the heart of mankind aches to know this other person in the fire. But friends, the only reason why they knew that there was a fourth person in the fire is because there were three people who wouldn't bow down. They wouldn't bend their knee. They wouldn't worship the golden image only God and because they put their faith but they put their trust in God they were a witness to all of Babylon of the greatness of the God that they served friends the only thing that will change our world that will leverage against the, the brokenness and the pain and the suffering and the trial is when the church stands up and says we worship God alone we know the person in the fire and he is walking with us he is for us and friends, he is for you. We have a message of love. We have a message of hope that the world needs to hear and it burns in our heart. The brokenness that presents itself in our world today. The riots and the demonstrations, the racism and the prejudice, the heartache and the brokenness, the fear and the, and the, the pandemic, all these things. We have a message of love and hope. And it's our job to walk, no matter what happens, to walk with him and present him to the world. That's our role. We're going to have communion together here in a moment. And before you're seated, I'm going to ask you to go to one of these stations. And I know the social distancing thing is not some of your cup of tea, but just so we don't pass germs and everything, we have the, the, the juice and we have the crackers. And you can grab one of those in a moment. And we're going to partake in communion together. And when we do that, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to evaluate ourselves. We're supposed to evaluate ourselves and we're supposed to really measure our own hearts in perspective of Christ and what he's done for us. And if there's anything in our hearts that is supposed to be there, we're supposed to do business. We're supposed to lay the gift at the altar and not participate in it unless we feel like Christ is who he says he is and we've uh, taken all of our, all, all of our heart and put, presented it to him and he's get, evaluated it, given it back to us. And he said, now, you're worthy to partake. Why? Because Jesus has paid the price on the cross for us. And so for the next few moments, I want you to go and I want you to grab one of the... the emblems, there's tables here and there's tables in the back, whichever one's closest to you. And as you wait for everyone to regather, I want you to evaluate your heart. And I want you to see where you're at. 
I want you to see if there is a, some wrong in your heart or some injustice that you need to take to God that you need to let him do business with. And so as Karen plays, if you can just go and find one of these stations and come back and we'll participate in communion together in a moment. a seat when you get back you just, my kids are pretty excited about snack time in church you know this is what it feels like preschool snack time here we are we're juicing crackers uh, but it's so much more than that isn't it when we think about what Jesus has done for us when we think about what he has done that he took his place in heaven and he abandoned that place he forsook it for the sake of you and me. He left his place in heaven. Think about this. He left in play his place in heaven, humbled himself, took the body of a man. Think about this. Think about this. I mean, how would you announce Jesus' birth? Today in the town of David, weighing five pounds, 11 ounces. No. The herald said, today a Savior is born. A Savior is born, and He's our Savior. And so when we take the juice and we take the crackers, we are proclaiming Him as Savior. He saves us from our sins. When we take communion, we know that Jesus' body was broken. I want you to hold your cracker. And uh, you can take as much or as little of it as you want, but, you know... And listen to Jesus for the body that was broken. Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus to us. And that by his body, broken body, we have healing. By his stripes, we are healed. The hope of the world, Jesus Christ, humbled himself, became obedient even to death on the cross. And we thank you for that. We thank you for that love, that unending love that in the moment of truth did not abandon us, but laid himself down for us. Thank you for that kind of love. Let's take the crackers together. You have your juice. We know that on the day night before Jesus was betrayed he ate the last supper they took the bread and they took the cup and when Jesus took the cup he said these words this cup is a new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me his blood flowed on the cross paying the price for our sins and our faith in him our faith in him makes us right it's one of the mysteries of salvation that our trust in him makes us right. And so let's take this cup together. God, we thank you. We proclaim your death through this bread and through this cup. We proclaim your death and we are ready for your return. We are ready for your return. We pray and we thank you for who you are, Jesus. Amen and amen. Red Foxtrot Alpha Beta Hola. Oh, there we go. 
Foxtrot, Trot, Tango, Bravo, Echo, Charlie. Well, good morning, everyone. I would say be seated, but looks like we got 99% of that covered. So, hello, I'm Thane, and I am doing the announcements this morning. The first and foremost thing on my mind as a youth pastor is camps are a go. I repeat, camps are a go. So, if your teens or kids are not registered yet, register. And it will be refundable if something was to happen, but it's not going to happen. We won't speak that in this house. So, yes, and amen. Camps will be starting, so sign up for kids camp, sign up for middle school, high school camp, whatever it may be. Sign up as a volunteer. We'd love to see you there. So if you have any questions, if you need scholarships, talk to me, talk to Ronnie, talk to my wife, talk to someone, because financially is not going to be the reason that no one goes to camps. We want your kids at camp, all right? Amen? All right, and on the other side of kids' ministry, this week you may have a nursery time between parents and small children. Next week, we are starting up a joined kids and elementary group. So, if you are comfortable with them meeting in that setting, that will be available to you. We also want to say with heart most from our heart from Yanni is that we don't mind having your kids at, in the sanctuary here. It doesn't matter to us. We, we love having them here. We love hearing them, and that's okay. Yes, there we go. Agreement is forthcoming here. Okay. From the Hearn pulpit, we have heard it. But, so, there's either option. You can have the kids in service. We love them here. But next week, if you want to send them back after worship, there will be a combined junior and elementary time there. So, amen. Thank you for helping us crawl out of this season. Also, yes, I agree, Adi. So, we also want to say thank you to you guys for, the, for your giving, your faithful giving during this time. We know that there's... In this season, there was a lot of turmoil, and finances were a part of it, but we thank you for just um, being faithful with God, what God's telling you to give. It allows us to keep us operating how we can operate and how we can serve people. So we thank you for that. Thank you for your support. Thank you most off for your obedience to what God's telling you to give. And also, I got informed this morning that if you want the bulletin, we do have bulletins this week. They are in the back by the tithes and offerings box. So with all these announcements that I give or anybody gives up here, now you can read them because you know what I do is I listen and say, yes, that was a great thing. I forgot three minutes in, and I don't know what's going on. So they are back there for your viewing pleasure. You can pick them up on the way out. And with that, let's head to the sermon bumper video, whatever this is called. So thank you, guys. Hey, you can turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. We'll get there in a moment. I just wanted to invite you, for you know that Carl and Sandra Fager, this is their last Sunday here at Park Hill. They've been attending Park Hill for 30 years now, and uh, they have been a blessing to this church in so many ways. And so we're going we're gonna to say farewell to them in uh, about 2 o'clock this afternoon from 2 to, two to 4, open house. So come this afternoon and participate with that. We'd love to see you there. And that is, that is one of the sad things about ministry is saying farewell, right? Goodbyes. No, not, not in our world. We'll see them again sometime, someplace. That's the promise of eternity as well. And so we love you guys, and we just uh, thank, so thankful for you guys here. And uh, I won't ask for a speech or anything, so... Yes, okay. And I, that's, that's a sad thing, but one of the good things is we had a baby born a few, a few weeks ago, and uh, uh, Shani is putting some meals together for the baiters. John and Tessa had their baby. Uh, 
what, a week and a half ago about. And so if you want to prepare a meal for them, if you can talk to Shani, that would be a blessing to them. And so uh, we love uh, growing families and we love kids around here. And so, yeah, that's exciting. Hey, uh, I don't know if you're, you know, what you've been doing in the absence of sports, uh, but in the absence of sports, some of you have been celebrating. Yes, no sports, you know, uh, no masters. I know, Steve, you mourned that. I mean, he cried for weeks, probably. Uh, but a lot of us, where there's no sports, maybe you've been replaying sports memories in your mind. One of my favorite sports memories was the 2009. I got to look over here and look at Jesse. He's not listening to me. The 2009 Grizz, when the Grizzlies played South Dakota State. Remember that moment? He remembers that moment because it was one of the greatest comebacks in sports history. Okay, one of the greatest comebacks, the, the game started off and it was a mess for Grizz fans. I don't know if you remember that game, but it was an absolute disaster. Uh, the, the South Dakota State took a three-possession three lead rather quickly in the game, and by the middle of the third quarter, the Grizz were behind 48-21. to 48-21, to 21, behind almost four touchdowns with all, just like 20-some minutes left in the game, and I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to leave. I wasn't at the game. I was at my in-laws' house, and I'm like, I'm going to leave. I just, this is a disaster. I need to go home. It's a few-hour drive. Get home and get ready for Sunday. I don't, who wants to watch your team lose this bad? And I almost left, but I stayed because my six-year-old son at that time, Malachi, said, Dad, you, got, you win some, you lose some. You just got to support the team. <laughs> I don't know where he heard that from. Oh, man put me in my place, and I said, mm, okay, fine, we'll watch them lose. But then something happened. Something happened. Because the greatest comeback, one of the greatest comebacks in FCS history happened. Mark Mariani returned to kickoff for a touchdown, and everything changed. From there, the Grizz rattled off uh, uh, 40 unanswered points in 20 minutes and won the game 61-48. to I almost missed it. I almost didn't wait for the amazing moment, the comeback. Friends, we've been talking about infinitely more, and I wonder how many times we miss infinitely more in our lives because we leave early. We quit too soon. Ephesians 3.20 is the promise that we've been holding on to through this sermon series, which simply says this, now all glory to God. You want to read it with me? I think so. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Infinitely more. Infinitely more. How often do we leave too soon? Do we quit too soon? Do we give up too early? Do we give up on that dream? Do we uh, quit working towards the vision that God's given us? Or do we simply quit trying? Too often, we do that with our marriages. We do that with our relationships. We do that with our, with our uh, people we're praying for. We do that so often, we just quit too soon. How often do we do the same with God? Now, I, the problem is, we asked at the beginning, you know, what's one thing you would wait hours for to do or to buy? And I can see, I'm sitting here thinking, and I'm like, nothing. Nothing. I am not that patient of a person. I would not wait in line for anything. I go into the grocery store. I see there's long lines everywhere. And I'm like, yeah, I'll come back another time. I don't want to wait in lines. I got better things to do than to wait. But how often do you feel like God has you waiting in a line? He has you waiting for that infinitely more. God, by his grace, gave us tools to measure time. He gave us days and weeks and the moon rise, the moon and the sun. They rise, they set, they come, they have seasons. And we measure seasons and we measure time. All these things, we measure time. But God is not measured by time. God works on a different time frame. Peter, who we've been talking about in this sermon series, wrote these words. He says, God, to God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. With Peter, is God confused? Does he need a watch? I mean, come on, what's going on, God? Because his time schedule is not our time schedule. God is not confused. And because God is not measured by time, often it feels like we, He has us waiting for eternities, for the things He's promised to pour into our lives. 
But God is incredibly patient, unlike me. And that means he will stretch my patience in these seasons of waiting, in these seasons of waiting for more, holding on to promises, holding on to dreams. The promise of infinitely more, in fact, is attached to the command to wait. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5 Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. He is between his time of of his resurrection and his ascension into heaven. And he's meeting with his disciples. And some of his last words are these to his disciples. Acts chapter 1 verse 4, he says, Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he has promised. As I told you before, John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now notice, Jesus gives his disciples the command. Don't leave until, and then he says, there's going to be a gift. There's going to be a promise. I promise you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he reminds them of this gift. In John chapter 14, 17, right before his betrayal, he gives this long teaching about the person of the Holy Spirit, who he is, what he's going to do, how amazing it's going to be to walk with the Holy Spirit. This is the gift I'm going to give you. Don't leave until you've received that gift. Wait for him. Now in the modern church, we often define how and when the Holy Spirit's going to come. And we often define how and when he can wave his power wand over our lives and everything's going to be changed instantaneously. And God, in his grace and in his wisdom, does it. We call those miracles, and he often does those things. But friends, how often does Jesus simply tell us to wait? To wait. God in his infinite wisdom tells us to wait. Infinitely more is actually promised to those who wait. And there's something in our our microwave world, which Pastor Ronnie mentioned earlier, that we don't do waiting really well. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and I learned this word. I didn't learn how to practice it well, but I learned this word. The old saints would say things like, you just need to tarry. And I was like, who is tarry? Right? Right? And that word was, was like, you just need to hang on. You just need to wait, spend that extended amount of time with God because you just don't know when the moment's going to come where his heaven's going to meet earth and things are going to change instantaneously. God's going to provide that, that infinitely more in your life. And we've lost that in our instantaneous, digital, fast-paced world. At the pace we, at the pace we live life, we find it hard to wait. I mean, just think of the things we've invented in the last century that will expediate our lives. I mean, I will want a coffee in the morning, and I will notice there's two cars in the drive-thru lane, and I'm like, probably too many for me, right? Probably too many. I just don't need that. I'll just drive right on by. Because why, I, drive-thru is for expediency, it's for speed, and that doesn't look very fast to me. There's pickup services where you, now you can shop online, call it in, whatever, and you can pick up all your groceries, you don't even have to go in, and it saves you how much time, right? Just speed. Hey, there's next day delivery. This thing came from Vermont, but you get it in a day. Imagine that. That is amazing. All the things that have increased speed in our lives. Unfortunately, all this pre-ordering to on-demand movies and delivery services, they're nice, they speed up life, but actually they are reprogramming our hearts and souls. And they reprogram our hearts and souls in such a way that we have to purposefully program our spirits for something different. J. Kim, in his book talking about the analog church, analog church in a digital world, writes these words. He says, Our digital world has programmed our souls for speed, choices, and individualism. Think about that. Speed, choices, and individualism. When I read the Bible and I look at it and I wonder, what in the Bible tells me that I can have everything fast, my way, you know, individualized just for me? There's nothing in the Bible. Those things are antithesis to God's kingdom. So how am I going to allow God to reprogram my heart and my soul in this digital world? Because speed, I want things now. A thousand days is like a year. I don't know. Jesus does things on a different timetable. Jesus tells us that infinitely more happens at his speed through his work done his way. Done his way. It doesn't sound like speed choices and individualism. 
It sounds like infinitely more happens through uh, submission to his heart, his plan, and obedience to him. Will I submit? Will I wait? Will I wait for what he has? Now, let me just step away from the sermon to describe something a little bit because I think this is important to understand when we talk about the person of the Holy Spirit. And we have this thing in the Pentecostal world which we call the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Why in the world would we refer to something called the baptism? I mean, there's no pool up here where we step inside the pool and the Holy Spirit's inside and we go, dip, now I'm immersed in the Holy Spirit, right? So why in the world does Jesus use this picture of baptizing I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John baptized with water. That's a pretty clear picture. And you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, the baptism thing is a pretty important thing in the Jewish culture, in the Jewish religion, actually. John used this to uh, baptism. It was coming out of a culture. You read Leviticus, and you would have to be cleansed, ritually cleansed in water. If you touched impure things, dead things, if you were going to enter God's presence, you need to be cleansed. And so they would come down into this thing called a mikvah, and they would dip down in it seven times, and they would come out, they'd be cleansed. And because of the baptism, because they were immersed in water. It was this outward expression of something they knew that God commanded, and so we're going to do it. If you were a Gentile coming into the Jewish faith, you would have to be baptized. You would be immersed in water. You'd have to dip down seven times. You remember Naaman's healing. Elisha said, go baptize yourself in the Jordan River seven times. And Naaman's like, why would I do that? Because it was an expression of faith. I believe God, who he said, and so it was calling on this Old Testament principle, this Old Covenant principle being immersed in water, something outward, an outward expression to revealing the heart nature of I trust in God's plan. Now John used that and he says, you don't just need a baptism for your body, you need a baptism for your heart. And your heart needs to be changed from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And so when you baptize, this is one of repentance. You're walking away from your sins and you're turning towards God. He was the voice calling out in the desert and say, prepare the way of the Lord. He's coming and the one that comes is going to save you from your sins. He's the Lamb of God. And so all they would walk to the Jordan River and they were baptized into repentance. Knowing that they needed a change. Now Jesus calls on this this, this, uh, picture and he paints this picture says john is baptized with water but i'm going to baptize you with the holy spirit why what does that even look like if you're going to wait you're going to be baptized because there's going to come a time jesus says and in a few days you're going to be baptized with the holy spirit and you're going to be immersed in his presence and guess what you will be changed infinitely more doesn't happen in our plan and our in our wisdom infinitely more doesn't happen in our power infinitely more happens through the power of the holy spirit this immersion in the spirit is going to be different the spirit is going to be full bring full cleansing of the soul it's going to change our hearts of, of stone ezekiel said to a heart of flesh and the spirit infinite in power is going to fully immerse every believer now, Paul writes this in, in his infinitely more prayer, leading up to this Ephesians 3.20, where it says, hey, God is able to do infinitely more than you might ask or think. He actually references, refer, references this, slow down, John, in Ephesians 3.16. When he writes these words, he say, says, I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through what? His Spirit. There's going to come a time And he's going to, through his glorious unlimited resources, the Spirit is going to immerse you. You're going to be full of his presence. And what's going to happen is you will be changed because all those glorious unlimited resources will leverage your heart towards change. And no longer will you have a heart of stone. You'll have a heart of flesh. And that water, as the water surrounds us in baptism, so the Spirit surrounds us and immerses us in his presence the thing that makes us different, the thing that, that leverages our lives for infinitely more is not our strength, not our power, Zechariah says, but by his spirit. It's his spirit that changes us. This is the same spirit that moves G, uh, Peter from bystander to leader, from full-fledged par- participant to the rock that Jesus declared that he would come. This Peter would be changed. So verse 6 says this, so when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore the kingdom? It sounds like they're changing the subject, doesn't it? It sounds like, hey, what, we're just, hey you wait, in a few days you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, it's going to be great. And the disciples are like, are you going to restore your kingdom now? Because I'm a little confused. 
Well, why would they say that? Well, I don't think they were totally confused because think about this. They know the prophets. What do the prophets say? Joel and Zechariah, what do they proclaim? The Spirit comes, and guess what happens when the Spirit comes? The kingdom of Israel will be restored. And so they're thinking to themselves, ah, so now is the time. We wait, the Spirit comes, and when the Spirit comes, guess what? The kingdom's going to be restored, and the nation of Israel is going to be put back in its rightful place, and guess what? We get prime seats. We're with you, Jesus. Is this the time? They're not confused. They are confused, but they're just knowing what they know. They're just speaking what they know. And why not now? The Holy Spirit's going to come. We're going to reign in this earthly kingdom with Jesus. And Jesus sets them straight, gently, again, the last time he does this in person. And he says to them, the Father alone has authority to set those dates and times. And they are not for you to know. Oh, what? Not for me to know. But you will receive power. So he re redirects them to what? Back to what they're waiting for. Don't get lost in all the details. The one thing you got to know is I'm going to send my spirit upon you. And what is he going to do? You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I love this. And I want to talk about this just for a second. This, this thought of Jesus that says, the Father alone has authority. Now, for some of us, we might be thinking to myself, because when you first read that, you're thinking, well, wait, now, does Jesus have no authority? Is there like big God, God, and then there's Jesus, little God? What happens? God has all authority. Jesus just has some authority. What's going on here? What's going on here? It kind of reminds me when one of my kids come to me and they say, Dad, can I have a snack? And I'm like, wait, wait, is that my question? Can they have a snack? I don't know. What kind of snack could they have? I don't even know what's in the cupboard, except for the things I eat. Is this in my authority to tell my kids I can have a snack? Because I think this is under Cassie's authority, right? Now, everything under my roof is technically mine and Cassie's, but tell, tell you what, I don't want to step on her authority because she might have plans for certain food in the house, right? And so I will submit to her authority over the food choices, and I will say, you better go ask her mom. And it drives her nuts. Why? Because they're like, why would they have to ask me? Right? Why would they have to ask me? You can tell them they can have a snack. But they don't want, they should probably eat the snacks I have, like chocolate chips. I mean, that's not the right snack. I'm a bad example for my kids. And so what is Jesus doing here? Jesus is practicing submission. He is comfortable with the Father's speed, choices plan. Jesus is demonstrating to his disciples submission. The Bible tells us that all authority under heaven, on, under, uh, under heaven on earth has been given to the Son of Man. It's been given to Jesus. But Jesus, even though that authority has been given to him, guess what? He practices submission to the Father. Why? To teach us. That's part of his humbling himself coming to earth is to teach us how to live, how to live life. And we need to learn to walk in submission. And so Jesus is teaching them this. How do you walk in submission? Jesus is perfectly comfortable with God's plan. God holds the plan for infinitely more. And he redirects them and says, hey, it's not for you to know those times or dates. Only the Father knows. It's this for you to know. God, who does infinitely more, is going to empower you. That's the plan. God, who does infinitely more, is going to empower you. But, but hey, it's not for you to know this. But do you know what you can know? you're going to receive power. You know what you, the promise you can hold on to? The power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that resurrected me from the grave is the same power that's going to live in you, and he's going to empower you to be what? To be my witnesses. To be the witness around the world, not just here, but in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. The promise you're waiting for, the Holy Spirit will transform your lives. God, who does infinitely more, will empower you exceedingly, infinitely more than you might ask or think. I want you to think of something that maybe you're tempted to give up on. Maybe you're tempted to give up on a relationship or a job. Maybe you're tempted to give up on a person. Maybe you're tempted to give up on our country right now. Maybe you're tempted to give up on, on, on an individual or a, a program or a work, something at work. Maybe you're tempted to give up. But you know in your heart that God put you there for a reason and a purpose. God has, God has put you there for part of his plan. And he's put you there because he wants to leverage you, his spirit in you, to provide infinitely more. Not just for you, not just for your family, but for those around you. Don't give up. Don't quit. 
don't quit. We all get tired of fighting, don't we? We all get tired of, of, of uh, all the stuff that, that just attacks us and comes against us. And Satan wants us more than anything to give up. He wants us to give up on that relationship, on that marriage. He wants to give, us, uh, give up on that person. He wants to give up on healing. He wants to give up on all this stuff. He wants us to give up. But the God who does infinitely more is going to empower us. The same spirit that lived in Peter, the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the grave, the same spirit that baptized Jesus on the day of the Jordan River is the same spirit that lives in us. The same spirit. That spirit that Jesus proclaimed when that day when Peter, remember Peter 16, 16, when he says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And what does Jesus say to Peter? Hey, you are a rock and on your, this rock, I will build my church. Jesus is saying, nothing's going to stop this witness to the end of the earth. That's how much power lives in us to bear witness to Jesus everywhere. The spirit will immerse you, he'll fill you, he'll transform you, he'll empower you to do infinitely more. You and I, we don't know dates and times. But you and I can practice waiting. You and I can practice receiving the Holy Spirit. You and I can walk in obedience of going and telling. Jesus' final commands were not about our right to worship. I've said this a few weeks ago, but about our responsibility to witness. Think about this. When he promises the Holy Spirit... It was not about, now you'll gather in perpetuity. He says, now you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. The whole thought of gathering is, is good. This is what we're supposed to do. The Bible commands us, and, and the right to worship is something that's fundamental to our Christian faith in America. But there are Christians all over the world that gathered this Sunday that didn't have a right to gather. And why did they gather because they understand that they don't just have, nothing, no one can take away their right to gather. No one can take away their right to worship. Because they have a responsibility to witness. The same power that lives inside of them is the same power, the same power that gathered Christians in India in the face of persecution today is the same spirit that is in our midst today. And the same spirit that propels a Christian in the faith of, face of persecution in China that propels them to be a witness to their neighbors and their friends is the same spirit that propels us to go and tell people around the world about Jesus. God is giving us a burden for our community. God is going to provide opportunities for our community. And God is going to give us boldness to share with our community who Jesus is. We have a responsibility to be witnesses. His final command hinges on this. You're going to be my witnesses. His final command, which we call the Great Commission, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go. This is the final command. And why does, why does he give that? How do we fulfill that command? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it in our own power. We can't do it in our own strength. We can't do it in our own wisdom. We need the Spirit in us and with us. Verse 9, after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. It is a strain to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them, men of Galilee, they said. Now, I want you to think about this. Okay, they are watching Jesus. This is the person, they, I mean, this is their life, Jesus, their master, their teacher, and all of a sudden he's Going up into heaven and he's rising. How fast? I don't know. But he is going up and he is disappearing. He's gone. And this, these two white-robed men suddenly say to them, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Why? I mean, come on. That's a, redun that's a, that's a rhetorical question, right? right? Because we are looking for Jesus. And they answer the question. They say, Jesus has been taken from you into heaven. But someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Now think about this. In the last moments of Jesus' life, Jesus gives these disciples two promises and one command. Two promises and one command. And the two promises actually saturate us and fill us to empower us to fulfill the command. And the promises are simple. You wait, you receive power. 
now go. And when you go, you understand there's, a, there's also a promise of what? I will return in the same way I came. Now think about this. This is, this is the amazing part of serving Jesus. Is he's promised us power to live this life, to be his witnesses on earth, and he's promised he's not going to leave us. He's coming back for us. He's preparing a place for us, and he will go, come back in the same way we've seen him go. Two promises, one command. When we lose heart, and we lose faith, and we lose hope, and we lose joy, we can hold on to those two promises, and we can commit to his plan. Jesus has promised to every one of us who wait, friends, you're going to receive power. The Holy Spirit's going to come on you, and you will be my witnesses. That's the command. Go, tell, make disciples. And someday I'm going to come back. Someday I will return. Don't give up. Don't quit, because the Holy Spirit is present in your life. And Jesus is coming back, the hope of the world. And he's going to come back and take you to be with him. Now, God doesn't do anything on accident. He doesn't tell his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit and then ascend into heaven and say, huh, see what happens. He sends his spirit to us. He sends his spirit to us, not just to immerse us, not just to, to make life easy, but he empowers us to live. He empowers us to be his witnesses. He empowers us to be transformed and changed. I want you to think about that thing that you've been maybe giving up on. That God-given dream, that God-given plan, that relationship, whatever it might be. That thing that you were tempted to give up on. And this morning, I want you to let go of that thing so you can receive the Spirit. Don't be distracted by the thing, okay? I want you to let go of that thing and put it into God's hands because it's his dream. It's his plans. It's his promises. And this morning, as you let go of those things, I want you to ask for the Holy Spirit to immerse you. Many of you in this room, you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. And that's that's an amazing gift, and I want you to use that gift this morning. Just begin quietly speaking in tongues and say, God, I want more this morning. Some of you, that's a, that's a mystery to you. You're like, what did you just say? Baptism? Speaking in tongues? What is that all about? Come back next week, okay? That's next week's sermon, okay? But this is what I want you to hear this morning. When you let go of the things. You've been holding on to him so tight. When you let go of the things and you receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to give you wisdom and strength and power. And the things that you let go will, will fade in comparison. When you realize God's promises and presence is with you, then you can hold on to him. And he will give you strength to pursue the things, the dreams that he's placed in your heart the relationships God's gifted you with. So let go of these things and pursue Him. Over these next few moments, God, right now, God, we don't understand why we've waited so long for certain things, maybe a salvation of a son or daughter, maybe a restoration of a relationship like a marriage. I don't know why we've waited so long for healing in so many cases where we've prayed and prayed and prayed. I don't know why we wait so long for restoration, for healing, for hope. But this morning, we put those things into your hands. We trust your plan. We don't know the dates and times, but we know this, you have authority over them. And so we, we release them to you. And God, we ask for your presence, your power, the Holy Spirit to come fresh and new in our lives. And God, I pray all over this room that you would fill with your mighty power. Your unlimited, glorious resources would work, filling us with inner strength through the power of the Holy Spirit. And God, we pray that by the end, we will know that immeasurable power has done infinitely more in our lives. You've transformed. God, you've led, you've guided, you've strengthened. So over these next few moments, we just wait for you. And God, we believe for the victory that you have promised. God, we believe that you will do what you've said you're going to do.
your promises are yes and amen. Over the next few moments as the worship team plays, I want you, maybe you'll sing, maybe not, but I want you to dedicate these next few moments to waiting on the Holy Spirit, asking Him to fill you and just receive from Him. Receive from Him His strength, His power, His wisdom.
that the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for turn it for good you turn it for good and you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good and I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle remember God who is able through his mighty power at work within us was he able to do to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think infinitely more don't stop don't quit hold on to the promises of God he is filling you with his power and strength to be overcomers to be victorious and he will return he will return in the same way we saw him go. He will return to take his church both dead and living out of this world. It's amazing to think about. And guess what? In between, we have the privilege of being his mouthpiece, of being his witnesses, to telling the world of this love and hope that we have. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't let go of God and believe 100%. 100% in his promises. Father, right now, through your glorious, unlimited resources, I pray the presence of the Holy Spirit would infiltrate and saturate every one of these people. May they be more than conquerors. May they know the love that surpasses everything. May they know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God. And may they see you do infinitely more than they might ask or think in their lives. God, may we let go of the things we're holding on to, receive from you, and trust your plan and purposes. Trust your plan and purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, next week, I'd encourage you to come. We're going to be talking and ending this service on inf uh, sermon series on infinitely more. And we're going to be talking about this person of the Holy Spirit. When we wait, what happens when the Holy Spirit comes? You don't want to miss next week when we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, receiving uh, from him who he is and all he is going to do in and through us. So come next week and remember this afternoon from 2 to 4, uh, Carl and Sandra, come visit them, say goodbye. Or see you later, I should say, right? See you later. So we'll see you soon. And thanks for giving on your way out.